26th webinar of the Digital Personal Data Protection Act 2023. Being organized by corporate professional is a part of its knowledge sharing initiative. So for the information of uh, Amar sir, that it is our 146, you came for our 100th program and we are continuing our journey since last three years. So this is our 146. Every Friday, four to six, we are doing our webinars. Congratulations. Thank you. Our very special thank and very warm welcome to our chief guest, Dr. Amar Patnaik, who despite his hectic engagement has joined us today to enlighten us on the new law on data protection in India. First of all, congratulations, Amar Bhai, for passing the historical bill. And I know that you have come at one o'clock in the night. And uh, despite of this, you are here. Thank you very much for your commitment. <clears throat> Friends, data is power and the new oil, which has the potential to unleash the true power of the economy. It is the new resource that is vital for the internet economy supporting innovation and building new age business. By use of data analytics and, in, and artificial intelligence technology, powerful insights are being generated to build new and innovative products and services across the world. However, rapid commercial use of personal data raises serious concern with respect to misuse and of sensitive and critical personal data and it's killing the privacy of each individual giving rise to the retirement of uh, requirement of the formulating robust data protection law. This law is equally important for the planned development of any economy as well as the national security. Friends, the objective of the webinar is to discuss and understand the legal landscape concerning data protection in India and also about the Digital Personal Data Protection Act 2023. In addition, we also wish to discuss the various strategy and how the corporate need to adopt to protect their data under the prevailing laws, including the Information Technology Act 2000. Before I invite uh, our chief guest to deliver his address, it is my privilege to introduce him and, panel and other panelists to the webinar. Dr. Amar Patnaik is a member of parliament representing Odisha in Rajya Sabha and General Secretary of Biju Janata Dal Parliamentary Party Office, the Upper House. He heads the party IT wings and is also a spokesperson of BJT. He is a member of Parliament Standing Committee on Finance and member of Subordinate Legislation, Rajya Sabha. He was also the member of Joint Parliament Committee on the Personal Data Protection Bill 2019, on which we are discussing today. Before becoming an MP, Dr. Patnaik was a career bureaucrat and he was a in the Indian Audit and Account Services officer. He was instrumental in detecting frauds in Bihar and Assam on the uh, various scams in 1990. He was also associated with the United Nations and the World Bank for Global External Audit Assignments. He was also team leader of Indian External Audit Mission to many countries. Importantly, Dr. Amar Patnaik is a very literate he has done BSc honors, MBA, LLB, Master in Public Management and PhD, educated at St. Stephen College, Delhi University, St. Javier Institute of Management, Bhubaneswar, Lee Kuan Yew University of Public Policy, Singapore, John F. Kennedy School of Government, Harvard, and Xavier um, uh, Call University of Odisha. So you can understand that how much varied experience and knowledge he has gained. He often writes on issues relating to economics, finance, technology, data, and environment, and has authored the book, Institu Institu Institutional Changes and Power Symmetry in the Context of Rural India. It is indeed our honor to uh, be with us, and he is one of the finest MP member of parliament of India, and the most important thing, he is our friend, and we have uh, study together in, in the Jubilee Hall. Uh, we all are, Pawan Duggar is also from the product of the Campus Law Center. So I welcome Amar Bhai for this program and we will definitely benefit from your expert knowledge on this subject. Then we have Mr. Pawan Duggal is a founder and owner of Pawan Duggal Associate and Head Artificial Intelligence Law Hub. He has been participating in the uh, as an advocate, Supreme Court of India, for over two decades, 
and has made an immense impact in the field of cyber law and law related to e-commerce. He is the founder and chairman of International Commissioner on Cyber Security Law. He has been acknowledged as one of the top four cyber laws around uh, lawyers around the world. He has spoken at over two thousand conferences, seminar, and workshop, and has lectured extensively in selected law colleges. As a writer, he has made his mark with one fifty four books on various aspects of law. He has been contributing. One fifty four is it? <laughs> Huh? Yeah. don't kill us. You know, giving an inferiority complex. No? <laughs> he has been a contributing a continuing weekly column titled "Brief Cases in the Economic uh, Times" for almost a decade, and I think uh, Pawan Dugal name is synonym with cyber law and the uh, information technology law. So I welcome Pawan uh, for this program. We all are alumni of law faculty and uh, so the University of Delhi. So today is the day of uh, our um, university. So let's uh, hear first Amar Bhai because I know he is uh, tired and he was not well also. So he can enlighten uh, with his uh, uh, opening remark because so many things are there which we will discuss today. Personal data, personal data breach, data fiduciary and how this can be. Um, uh, so Pavan with Dukal will tell. But most important thing, over to you, Amar Bhai. Please tell us about this. Now, this is the law. You came last time and you have explained, but now the law has made and you have contributed a very immensely in this. So over to you, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Pavan Vijay and Mr. Pavan Dugal. Uh, both Pavans, uh, you know, it's a tongue twister, actually. Uh, and uh, thank you to all the uh, participants uh, who have joined in here. Uh, I see a huge number, actually, 167 participants. Uh, so thank you so much for organizing this. And I see the uh, prolific nature of this, uh, uh, you know, uh, group that you have formed, because uh, quite often you find that, uh, uh, you know, they don't hold those meetings uh, regularly. But I myself have convened uh, two parliamentary uh, groups, informal parliamentary groups of MPs, one on uh, you know, uh, handloom and handicrafts and the other one on technology, but uh, haven't been able to organize these meetings so frequently as you are doing. And so not just frequently, I think you're just following a time schedule, which is very difficult to follow in our professional busy lives. So I'll come to this that, uh, you know, when I was a member of the uh, Joint Parliamentary Committee on Personal Data Protection Bill, uh, we spent two years on it. and. Uh, out of the 98 clauses that were uh, introduced by the government in the Lok Sabha, and then it got referred to the Joint Parliamentary Committee. Uh, there, were, uh, there were amendments made in about 98 of them. Uh, this, those were not amendments in the sense uh, of major structural changes. Major structural changes in the uh, bill which was introduced by the government uh, were few, uh, but since uh, there are too many uh, lawyers like us, including Vinakshi and uh, Manish Tiwari, and also we went line by line and clause by clause and made some changes here, there. So that probably, and then P.P. Chobri came and became the chairman who was the early law minister as well and the lawyer himself. So in the event, it actually lost shape of this original uh, bill. Uh, the original bill, however, was uh, largely uh, taken from the EU GDPR. Uh, so uh, there was a there was a uh, rethink at the government level uh, that since there are so many amendments to the original uh, bill, uh, it could it should be withdrawn, and that was withdrawn, and a new bill, a fresh bill, uh, would be introduced uh, in the parliament, and that is what uh, they did in the form of the uh, digital data protection bill instead of only the personal data protection bill. They called it as the Digital Personal Data Protection Bill 2023. Uh, I will. I have my little bit of quarrel on this itself. I'll talk about it. You could discuss about it later, and you know, I'll probably be happy to uh, hear the recording or get a gist of what was the discussion. The uh, uh, the, the the feeling while withdrawing the whole bill was that that European Union and India are at different levels of digital revolution. 
there are different levels of uh, if you if, if, if you want if you, if you would like in the in the life cycle of let's say a digital economy uh, we are at a uh, at, at an ascent stage and European Union was already there for a long time and therefore we could not actually borrow completely and uh, do a kind of a cut and best of the uh, UGDPR regulations and apply it to the Indian context. The government was of the view that since we are for the first time uh, using data in such a large scale uh, and making it available to promote uh, data-based digital revolution in the country uh, through various, uh, uh, you know, um, startups in the technology field. And since the emer emerging technology was also uh, an exciting field for young, young boys and girls to get uh, uh, in under the skin of this technology, there was a tremendous possibility of using this data for development and solving some of the society's most toughest problems, particularly in the areas of agriculture, health, education, insurance, many such areas. And therefore, the feeling was that the previous law was more uh, prescriptive. Uh, some of it could actually become part of the rules rather than being in the uh, act itself. So the new law which they uh, have uh, brought in and which was passed in the uh, parliament in the last session was much simpler, is much simpler, is more principle-based. Uh, the, the number of chapters is also less. And uh, uh, a lot of it has been left for to the rulemaking of by the central government. Uh, so this is the background of the uh, new uh, law. Uh, the new law, however, did not go through the uh, process of a standing committee or a select committee, was not discussed. Uh, and in the parliament also, I think there was a boycott by the opposition, walkout by the opposition in Rajya Sabha, maybe also in Lok Sabha. So I don't think there was adequate discussion on the bill. Uh, I have written on this, uh, the draft of this new bill from time to time, at number of places, I, uh, in a number of publications, both print and digital. For example, I've written too simplified for comfort. It is too, too simplified for comfort because I think it, give, it gives a lot of scope for subsequent delegated legislation making by the central government, even though central government is the largest, probably one of the largest data fiduciaries in, in, in itself, itself affected uh, by the by this law. So, so I think, uh, uh, there, I, there, there I, have, I have written uh, in that particular article also about the fact that, uh, you know, the the regime that was uh, that has been uh, thought of is uh, besides the fact of uh, uh, the the uh, uh, rule making being delegated excessively uh, is the fact that uh, they would have a list of countries where uh, where where data could freely flow. Uh, this was subsequently, after discussion with many people, uh, I think they, instead of a, a white list, they have uh, a list which is a list of like a blacklist, I would say, or a list of countries where data cannot be, uh, should not be uh, transferred. And that will be notified by government from uh, time to time for cross-border data flow. They removed many of the provisions of hard localization, but they have retained the provision saying that if a particular sectoral regulator would like to follow a different restricted regime of localization, then that would prevail, in which case RBI has already required your data to be stored in, in India as far as payments are concerned, uh, similarly for PMLA. So I think in the previous bill, this, uh, the, uh, the data protection board was required to have an MOU with each of the sectoral regulators and it had, pro it had a little more of primacy um, uh, over the other uh, regulators as far as data was concerned. Uh, this, is, uh, this has been diluted uh, in, this, uh, um, in this law. So it has been made very simple. But I don't see, I, that's what my article was. I don't think that uh, this would actually, because, because this is the data protection bill is supposed to fit into the overall development of the digital ecosystem in the country where the Digital India Act will be coming, where is the competition law, the revised competition, digital markets act. Everything would actually be fitting into place for an orderly growth of the digital ecosystem. So I think I don't think that is going to happen in such kind of a situation. That's what I had written. 
And another important thing is also I wrote somewhere about cross-border data flow uh, uh, problems. But uh, by by while uh, you know after discussion, it was actually put up for public consultation before being introduced in the Lok Sabha. So the advantage is that uh, even though it was not formally introduced and therefore did not have been referred to, could not have been referred to a standing committee, they put it in the public domain, had a lot of consultation, and when they introduced the bill. Some of it had already been taken, and that is how instead of the white list, they had the black list. And some, some changes they made from here and there. But my uh, I have spoken about it while speaking about it in the Rajya Sabha. Um, however, I made four or five points, which I'm going to mention here, which you could discuss. The uh, first thing was that you know they have now said this bill has been introduced as a digital personal data protection uh, bill. Now, uh, and, and, it, and, and, and it has been defined, data has been defined that anything which is maintained in digital form or anything which has physical data subsequently converted into a digital format. Uh, but you see, if you look at the Putta Swami judgment, Putta Swami judgment's right to, right to privacy applies to both digital and physical. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't say that, you know, it will be only digital and not physical. Even physical data can lead to uh, uh, you know a murder or somebody being blackmailed or somebody anything can happen and that could happen let's say in a block office in a block office as people are giving applications for let's say house and somebody gets to know uh, from the data physically takes the data and say uh, and causes some kind of a harm to the data principle or uh, because of, or because of a leakage that has happened then i think uh, the person can go go and go, go to the court constitutional courts to seek relief because his data has been breached and he has been uh, a harm has been caused to him uh, so how that was my question are they going to have a separate physical data protection uh, bill so the, I, the the thought process in government is that eventually everything will become digital and therefore uh, therefore it is called digital personal data protection bill in that case, my thought is again, the, the earlier definition was then fine, personal data protection bill. Uh, digital personal give, gives the impression as if there is something else which uh, it will not, the act will not cover. Uh, and the word privacy has never been used anywhere in the act, whereas that is, this is a privacy law, keep, people keep on saying that was again the comment which I made. The third important, great, grave, uh, great difference between the earlier version, this version, and how it is to be negotiated, which you could actually discuss is the concept of harm. So harm uh, uh, harm was earlier in the bill, harm could be of various types. Now here, the harm has been reduced to gains or losses. In the definition, you will find gains and losses, which basically means it is financial gains or financial losses. What happens to reputational loss? Reputational loss is the biggest factor affecting women, children, even families. So this reputational loss has not been uh, uh, included. And I, I raised, and I do not, I didn't get an answer from the minister on the on this particular thing. But this is going to cause a worry because the impression that the bill gives is as if the data protection or the data protection of the data principles or citizens of this country is being given by the government by way of this act. No, this has already been given by the constitution now by way of interpretation by the Supreme Court, whether there is this law or not, there is no law. If a citizen, citizen's data is breached and some harm has been caused to him, he could actually go to the court of law. So government is only another instrument, another data fiduciary governed by this law. But the impression, even in the earlier bill, while during discussion and here, the impression that was being given by government is that, no, we are giving you this, which is actually uh, a very bureaucratic way of looking at it. And I'm sure the bureaucracy would have probably uh, had an overbearing impact while writing this law. And therefore, this is the approach. I'm sure some of it will get struck down in the uh, courts if someone approaches it, because government is the biggest uh, uh, data fiduciary. And if right to privacy is a fundamental right now as has been interpreted then you one knows that the maximum amount maximum number of cases for uh, infringement of citizens fundamental rights is against government article uh, 326 and article 32 so if that is what 
then how can it insulate itself and be a judge of its own cause? That is that is reflected as number of places in the bill, uh, and I'm sure this is this is going to face a uh, stiff uh, uh, challenge in the courts, and 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 the courts will have to exercise, uh, you know, would have to exercise uh, their uh, uh, diligence against the framework which have set up that uh, it is an integral part of citizens' life, and therefore it is a fundamental right, and therefore constitutional guarantee is now being given. It is not a statutory guarantee. Statutory law is only enabling it and operationalizing it. So this is the, that was the point which I had raised. Then the, there, was a, there is this issue of uh, exemptions, which was there in the earlier bill as well. It is there in the current bill as well. And instead of being very narrow and very focused uh, and following the principle of reasonableness, following the principle of fair uh, uh, fairness proportionality i think the exemption list was too too large too 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 broad so there i thought uh, more you know now that it is already mentioned nobody wants to nobody wants to lose one's uh, um, you know uh, the, the luxury of not having to comply with the particular act nobody wants to give that up so how they will, the, it was told by the minister in the house that we will uh, take care of it during rule making. Rule making has to be subsidiary uh, business. So I really do not know uh, how they will be able to address this, but exemptions have been given to a large number of people uh, and across the board activities, which is not understandable. And there was this point which uh, is there about exemptions being given also to startups and to st the exemption being given to startups from what? From a, but a rule, I, I don't remember, I think it is rule eight, uh, which requires the uh, data to be, uh, uh, you know, the, following the principle of data to be kept confidential, accuracy to be maintained uh, and other things. Now, I think that is a requirement even for startups. Startups also will have to keep data in a manner in which its accuracy is maintained, its integrity is maintained, its comprehensiveness is maintained. How can you give exemption against that? I could understand that the starters would probably have exemption or a longer transition period to follow the, uh, or to modify the business to be able to give those rights to the data principles, which he has now a right to raise a right to be forgotten, uh, whatever all those things. So I think uh, that's where uh, there is a problem. And of course, the biggest thing is the is the independence of the data protection board, uh, which it was called an authority earlier, and it is to my mind it has been reduced to that of uh, that of even a uh, it's a statutory body. I have argued a, a number of places that its position should have been very exalted simply because of the fact that it is a, it is to decide if there is a data breach by another constitutional authority, let us say at the Supreme Court, by the President's office, in the Prime Minister's office, by the CAG's office, Election Commission's office. These are all statutory bo uh, constitutional bodies. Suppose there's an allegation of data breach and because of that some harm has been caused to somebody by the UPSC, let us say. Then how will this small uh, ill-empowered ill body be able to impose a penalty on these uh, people, uh, these uh, functionaries, these authorities. So it's independence, it's stature, it's uh, uh, ability to perform is something which I uh, I think I, I think is strongly suspect. Uh, then there is uh, another very uh, uh, very uh, I thought uh, surprising, and uh, I thought would rather rather use the word. Uh, you know, unnecessary provision which has been used in the provision in the act that even after doing all this, even after a diluted data protection board uh, structure, if they pass any order or if they do anything, then the central government can suspend, override, do anything to that particular order. Then why to have the data protection board? It is as if the central government is running the uh, uh, the data protection uh, regime in this country, and that is what was I was trying to say at the beginning that this right has not been given by the central government. This right has been given by now by the constitution, by the Supreme Court, and by reading into the constitution, by the constitution. It's a constitutional right. So the state is merely, you know, it is one of the persons who could be an offender or could be a defender. 
it should be the first thing is that it should be a defender of this right for citizen because it's a welfare state. But it could, if it offends the citizen's rights, then the citizen has the liberty to go to the uh, uh, court of law directly. And that is also a fund uh, fundamental right, the, the right to go for, for, for justiciability of his, uh, of enforcement of his rights. So I think, uh, and then the there's another point relating to TDSAT being uh, made the appellate authority instead of having the uh, separate authority. Maybe from the point of view of, uh, uh, you know, ease of administration, it may be easier, but uh, one suspects strongly uh, the capacity of the TDSAT uh, to handle this particular uh, vertical, unless they create a separate vertical within the TDSAT maybe. Uh, and and uh, here these cases, uh, there is a uh, there is a, there is the other thing is relating to Right to Information Act. You know, Rule Eight Eight One F has been diluted sub, uh, substanti substantially uh, by putting it under the exemptions. Uh, sorry, by putting it uh, uh, under the uh, definition of uh, personal data uh, instead of you know linking it to the Supreme Court's uh, direction. Supreme Court's uh, uh, judgment which says that uh, even personal data could be released uh, in, in the larger public interest. So this public interest doctrine has been completely forgotten. I thought they could have brought that particular provision under the exemptions rather that you know if there is a there is a um, greater public interest to be served, then the government need not take consent of the person before releasing the data. Uh, that would have actually enhanced transparency because. In the name of protecting the privacy of citizens, transparency of government cannot be sacrificed. Uh, I don't look at them at both these things as diametrically opposite. In fact, if looked at it properly, then they should actually be complementing each other. Uh, the, the, the protection of citizens' privacy is the job of the government. Uh, and uh, if you are uh, transparent, uh, it doesn't mean that you know, citizens' privacy uh, would, be, would be affected. In fact, if you are transparent, then a uh, citizen's privacy may actually get enhanced because uh, he doesn't really have to share a lot of data or personal data at all because government will be transparently doing everything. So he doesn't have to uh, share uh, many of the data. On encryption, the word encryption again has not probably been used anyway, uh, but to complete the process of this regime would be to bring in a non-personal data uh, regulation. And there I think data is being treated as a uh, as an asset, uh, and uh, that law, we'll see how that comes about. Uh, there is a last point relating to the personal data protection case relating to penalties, where penalties has been converted earlier in the very first version of the bill, which was introduced in the parliament. It was a percentage of the gross global gross revenues. That was the penalty that, that could be imposed on the, on the uh, uh, data fiduciary for breach of uh, uh, data and 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 uh, subsequent harm or consequential harm to the data principle. This has been reduced for and it, it, people say 250 crores is a big amount, but I thought 250 crores is a small amount for big tech companies. And more importantly, uh, data breach of uh, women and children have been. Have, and therefore, the subsequent, uh, uh, the consequential harm that is caused to them, the penalty for that is at a level which is lower, so is, uh, which I thought was, uh, I think it is at C or something in the schedule. So I think this is uh, this is probably not the right way of looking at it. In fact, data breach of children and uh, women should be drawing a stiffer penalty rather than the uh, rather than a lower penalty. So this is also one of the points which I had raised on that day in the uh, floor on the floor of the parliament while speaking on this bill. Um, the only and the brightest thing, however, is that at least we have got along. At least we have got along, and we have been talking about it for so long. So at least there is a framework, and then jurisprudence will improve. Will 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 uh, slowly uh, improve. Slowly, slowly, uh, uh, you know get accumulated with judgments coming from various uh, constitutional courts and uh, high courts uh, and even for that matter the data protection board this has happened in case of rti as well a lot of the uh, jurisprudence developed uh, because of the judgments from time to time so hopefully in this case 
the same would happen, which would be more context specific, cultural context specific to India, and that would be useful. Uh, there is a point which uh, I have written extensively in newspapers, and I also spoke about it in the parliament on day on that day, and uh, on the need for having separate state level data protection boards or data protection authorities. Uh, I feel that this is this is extremely uh, an important point. Uh, which has been completely relegated to the background and not been taken seriously by the earlier committee and by this committee because there's no time. This is bound to come up separately uh, as an issue later because there are state laws. States make their own laws and central government has no business to be interfering in uh, laws which have been made on this uh, list to or, or, or the state list uh, as given in the constitution. If there is a data breach, by the uh, uh, state functionary or a state government for the laws which have been made by them, why would a central, centrally appointed data governor, data protection board be, uh, you know, uh, adjudicating whether this has caused uh, harm to X individual? What is the kind of penalty to be imposed? If there is a disruption of public order in a place, then whether to suspend internet or whatever. Currently, the police could take that uh, action uh, as far as imposition of penalty. But to, to take action of not taking citizens' consent to process that data during such period is, again, you have to go back to the central government. So this is not really going to work well, I know, operationally. And this is, this is also, uh, I think, uh, uh, this, this is, this, this is, there is evidence that there is, a, this is, the, the way this has been made out in the bill, uh, uh, it is evident that uh, they have not consulted the states. And it is true indeed they have not consulted the states. When at least to two states we went, uh, when Mr. P.P. Chaudhary was there, Maharashtra and Karnataka, they all objected to the earlier version of the bill for not having a state-level data protection board. And I'm sure they are going to do it now. People have not really understand, understood the full import of the bill once it gets, starts uh, ticking in. Uh, you you will have this problem. And uh, states, that's why I've raised it on behalf of all the states in the Rajya Sabha, in the Council of States. States should ask a simple question that what is the difference between data and information that you have put RTI Act, where RTI uh, uh, appellate, sorry, the, the dispute resolution is there within the state. There are separate information commissioners, state level information commissioners. What is the difference between a consumer protection uh, law or a consumer protection uh, 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 court and uh, or consumer protection regime and the current uh, uh, privacy law because uh, if consumer courts can function from districts and that is for the benefit of their the citizens because we think that uh, uh, in India the consumer is not able to go to file its complaint electronically so it will be easier access to justice and the consumer movement will get stronger but in this case uh, you do not have anything. So you expect that a person's data, which has been breached and his uh, harm has been caused to him, let's say in lay, will start sending email to the data protection board and expect the justice to uh, come to justice to be delivered to him quickly. Uh, I think, you know, uh, it, 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 it is too utopian. So it, it has not been pragmatically uh, drafted as far as this aspect is concerned. And uh, this will again create problems of center state relations subsequently. Imagine a situation in which there is a data breach complaint against the CM's office, chief minister's office of any particular state, uh, and the person to decide whether there is a breach and therefore penalty has to be imposed on the chief minister's office by a data protection board sitting at Delhi, appoint all the members of whom are appointed by the central government. It is not like the chief election commissioner, because chief election commissioner is a constitutional body. So some amount of trust is there with the government. Whereas this data protection board is a statutory body whose members can be changed by the central government at any time. And whatever decision they can do, they do can also be overwritten by them by any time. So I think broadly, these were the these, these were the these were these were the uh, lacuna about the law, which I feel are there. But uh, I am uh, happy about the fact that there is at least a law. And there is something to work on. There is something which uh, which provides a framework of purpose limitation, data minimization, quality, and, uh, you know, accountability. Uh, hopefully, the jurisprudence will develop after the 
uh, you know, from time to time as as we progress in operationalizing this uh, act and 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 uh, data fiduciaries, uh, that is, sorry, data principles, as well as data fiduciaries and consent managers realize the kind of uh, responsibilities uh, that they have uh, in order to satisfy the rights of the data principles. With this, I'll end my uh, speech. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amar Rai. Thank you. You have actually given the other side of the story that how this law has come and what are the discussion has taken place, which we can't identify by reading this law. And this point which you have mentioned that if the statutory body is there and then something uh, leak is there, then you will penalize them. And the aspects of the statutory body versus the uh, the constitutional body, definitely it's a, it's a interesting um, uh, discourse you have discussed in uh, the parliament and the committee. So thank you very much. Thank you for your insight and thank you for your uh, giving us the uh, the input and the food for thought also for our discussion so i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm i'm unable to listen to the guru who is present here so i'll hear his uh, i'll hear his uh, recording i hope you'll send it to me so that i can i can i can yeah, uh, yeah definitely 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 maybe i will send you the link also and we can understand uh, you on behalf of everybody in the country you have worked yesterday uh, last three, four days you are doing. So thank you, Amar Bhai, and congratulations again for the historical thank passing you. of this bill. Thank and you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, Baban. Thank you. All thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So now turn to uh, listen to our uh, star um, uh, performer, um, Pavan Duggal. Okay. And whenever there is a discussion on any topic relating to uh, the digital database, digital personal database, cyber law, and you will not find Pawan Dugal, it's not possible. So now over to you, Pawan Bhai, because this topic is very interesting. And actually, the people are not understanding this is a topic which is connecting to each and everybody as soon as the digital literacy is increasing, it means the digital privacy data is misuse is also increasing. We are every day we are seeing that something is happening and some fraud is taking place and the fraudster is getting our internal data and then using and asking us and then they are doing. So the protection is very, very important and understanding also different and sometimes which just now uh, Amar um, uh, uh, has mentioned that by mistake you are, your data is misutilized. So how to do it? A statutory body is doing and the person is there working. He is misutilizing how you do. So over to you, Pawan Bhai. Then we will have a question answer and uh, we listen. So over to you uh, for explaining everybody the, how this law and how this can be a uh, and what is the purpose and how everybody can understand this for their own benefit. Thank you, Pavan Bhai. Uh, hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, my sincere thanks to Dr. Amal Patnaik for uh, giving the complete landscape and the background and uh, the intrinsic vision from a lawmaker's standpoint. In fact, his work has been phenomenal and his contribution in uh, the entire cause of data protection legislation has been uh, yeoman and very impressive. So with these words, I think, let me uh, try to share some presentation, some small ideas that I had, and then we would be uh, happy to open it up to question answers as we go forward. So when I talk about data protection and the professionals, I get different visions in my mind. Why? Because uh, data is governed by professionals. Data is generated by professionals, and uh, professionals are, in any case, dealing with a lot of data. But let's look at this recent report by Palo Alto Networks, which is saying that India is becoming a target of uh, increased cybersecurity breaches. If that's happening, 
Why is this happening? Because these cybersecurity breaches are ultimately only going to target data. And it's this very data that people are concerned with. So assuming in India, there's a data breach, people normally tend to take it very lightly. But this uh, report tells us that the average cost of data breach in India reaches about 17.9 crore rupees in 2023. Now that's the kind of volume of money that you would require in order to just deal with the various ramifications of the data breach. We actually, when we saw the COVID data leak, that was also a great starting point for India to start looking at the fact that you will have to start uh, analyzing why these data breaches are happening and what specific steps need to be taken so as to minimize both the frequency and also the impact of these data breaches. The problem gets more confounded in the Indian context because ransomware has become the topmost headache for corporates and for data stakeholders. Every 11 seconds, one company anywhere in the, in the world, including in India, becomes a victim of a ransomware attack. And if I look at only India, as per this report, there has been a surge of over twofold times increase in uh, ransomware cyber attacks in India only in the first six months of 2023. So the corporate ecosystem is flourishing. The government has been supporting this ecosystem and has been coming up with enabling legal frameworks from time to time. But when I talk about corporates, the heart, the soul of the corporate operation lies in corporate data. Because this is the new data economy where data is the new oil. And therefore, this data becomes important. And the rapid increase in cybersecurity breaches is also primarily happening because of the interest and the focus attention of cyber criminals on data. On top of it, the entire ecosystem is dramatically changing. Newly emerging technologies are coming in. And therefore, there is not just more generation of data. These technologies like artificial intelligence are also galloping and are also consuming a lot of data for purposes of appropriate testing. So ensuring compliance and proactive compliance with cyber legal provisions has to become the topmost priority of every corporate. On top of it, cybersecurity becomes very important because it's this very cybersecurity that's getting targeted. So the moment I talk about data protection, I cannot be complete in my reference without referring to data protection in the context of cybersecurity. But in the cybersecurity space, I find that Indian legal frameworks are not adequate. India does not have a dedicated law on cybersecurity yet. Though we did define the term cybersecurity, under the Information Technology Amendment Act 2008 after the Mumbai attacks. And the way we've defined cybersecurity is again, very, very uh, phenomenally broad to include uh, protecting information, equipments, devices, computers, computer resources, computer uh, communication devices and information stored therein from unauthorized access, use, data, uh, disclosure, disruption, modification or destruction. Now, it's referring to cybersecurity in the context of information. That's the IT Act. But when I look at Section 2 of the IT Act, and I look at the legal definition of the term information, it has been defined to include data. Similarly, when I look at the definition of data under the IT Act, under Section 2, I find that it has been defined to include information. So we have this interplay of exchanges of uh, perceptions when I'm defining both uh, information and data. We had come up with a national cybersecurity policy in 2013, but that's remained a mere paper title. And uh, the new cybersecurity strategy is still awaited, but while new regime comes up, India has already now come up uh, with last year, the IT directions. Now these are known as the information technology directions 2022. These have come into effect in 28th of June, 2022. And they're applicable 
to all corporates, all entities in India, including government. And they primarily mandate the moment you come to know of a cybersecurity breach, you must be able to report this mandatorily within six hours of coming to know about it. Otherwise, you uh, could potentially be facing this problem. So that was the position that was happening prior to August this year. In fact, earlier prior to August 2023, India did not have a dedicated data protection law. And the only law that was applicable was the Indian Information Technology Act 2000. Now, this law is a 23-year-old legislation. When Parliament passed this law, it did not have the slightest of ideas of what it was doing. Everybody thought it's just a law on promoting e-commerce. Little did people realize, or the parliament or parliamentarians realize, that the IT Act will, over a period of time, become India's mother legislation for everything in the digital format. So in India, the moment you use computers, computer systems, computer networks, computer resources, communication devices, as also data and information in the electronic form, you get covered under this law. Now in this context, we now have this new Digital Personal Data Protection Act 2023. 11th of uh, August 2023 is a day when the president gave assent to the said law and it was published for information in the official gazette. Now, after this, there has been a lot of hectic activity. Two days back, we saw the minister announcing that uh, we would have the rules in about a month's time. And uh, there's also some kind of uh, gestures, some kind of information in the public domain that entities might be given a year's time to comply with the DPDP Act. But when I look at this uh, DPDP Act 2023, I find that there's been a long journey. Dr. Patnaik talked about this long journey and how the propositions and perspectives evolved over a period of time. Now, the first thing that we need to know under the DPDP Act is it is only applicable to digital personal data. It's not applicable to personal data. So if your personal data is in the digital form, then also this law would apply. If your personal data is in a non-digital form, but then it's subsequently digitized, then also this act would apply. But if your personal data was in a non-digital form, that's not digitized, then that personal data is not going to be covered under the ambit of this law. Now, from a layman's perspective and from a practitioner's perspective, broadly speaking, this law talks about three broad concepts. These are concepts of data principle, data fiduciary, and data processor. A data principal is a person who owns the data which he generates or the, the data to whom uh, the person belongs or that's data. So if I am Pavan Dugal and I'm generating data about myself, I become the data principal because it's my data. I have control. I have rights. I'm generating my own data. The second concept is that of data fiduciary. Data fiduciary in the law is a concept which has been defined to mean an entity who determines how the personal data of a data principal is going to be processed. So the decision how it's going to be processed will be taken by data fiduciary. And therefore, this is the most important concept. And of course, the third concept is that of data processor, which is a legal entity that's going to process the data of a data principal on behalf of a data fiduciary. So let me give an example. I want to go and pick up a new telephone SIM connection. I go to the local market, the local telecom operator uh, office, and I say, hey, here is my application. Here are my details. Here is the copy of my identity. Please give me a new SIM. Now, they take this information. In that ecosystem, I become the data principal. Now, once I give the information to them, then they go ahead and issue me a duplicate SIM or a fresh SIM. But they become the data fiduciary because they will then determine how my personal data is going to be processed. Now, this uh, data company or this cellular company may offshore or may outsource this particular uh, data processing to a third party. 
because it's primarily to the cellular business. It's not into the data business. So it gives uh, the uh, outsourcing of this operations to company A. So in a scenario like this, the cellular operator company who's issued me the duplicate SIM or the original SIM is the data fiduciary, whereas the company A, which is ultimately going to process my data as a data principal for the data fiduciary will become the data processor. So the first thing first, in India, the concept has always been that uh, we don't believe in uh, you know, hiding information. We, are all, we all love to share information. And we are all from the uh, sharing uh, ecosystem. In fact, there's a, a common uh, tale that by the time you start your railway journey and by the time you finish your railway journey, you know far more things about your co-passenger than uh, before. Now, that was much true earlier, not true this time because people are very much reserved when they are on railway journeys. But then the fact is, Indians have by and large originated from a joint family system where sharing has been the norm of the day. So sharing of data has become, has been the de facto norm and nobody had any problems. It's only the last few uh, decades that we saw massive increase about awareness about uh, privacy, data privacy, and the need for data protection. So the first thing first, the law says, before you move forward as a data fiduciary, please give a notice in writing to the data principal, uh, us telling him that you are proposing to collect his information. This is the specific purposes for which you will be collecting the information. And these will be the remedies that the concerned data principal will have, should he not be satisfied about the said uh, data collection. Now, once as a data fiduciary, you give the notice to the data principal, the law says the data principal will have to give you a crystal clear, unambiguous consent to the set processing, which means if the consent is there, only then will you be able to process. If the consent is not there, you will not be able to process this information. Now, the first thing that people want to ask is, well, it's become the law of the land. Is it already implemented? Section one of the act says that different, uh, this particular section, this particular law is going to be implemented on such date as the central government may notify in the official visit. And that different portions of the law are going to be implemented in different periods of time by the government. So as right now, when I look at the Gazette notification, of 11th of August, 2023, it only talks about publication of, for information of this new law. That means it's, though it's been made the law, it's not yet been implemented. Well, the first fundamental question that people have is, well, this is a Digital Personal Data Protection Act. It is not applicable to me. So here, let's look at this uh, kind of an ecosystem, picture of who all gets sucked in. Almost anybody who is either an individual, who is a body corporate, who is a company, who is any legal entity barring a body corporate, could, he, could be a, uh, a limited liability partnership, could be a normal partnership, could be a society, could be a trust. And of course, it will also include intermediaries and will include the government at large. So these are the various sectors where the corporates are going to be dealing with personal data in a digital form. So therefore, they will now be required to ensure compliance with the provisions of the DPDP Act. So whether you are in the aerospace sector, you are in the agriculture sector, you are in the chemical industry, construction sector, defense industry, education industry, gas industry, or you are in the music industry, steel industry, any industry, transport industry, I think almost in every industry, in every field of activity, you are ultimately collecting information, personal information. Even if you don't have any outside or outlooking uh, perspectives, you still will have employees. So you will still be collecting their personal information, whether it's their medical records, whether it's their bank records, their financial records, for the purposes of transferring salary or other benefits. So you automatically are dealing with the digital personal data and therefore you will be covered under this law. Now, one question that people ask is, to whom and what kind of data does it apply? 
Uh, well, it applies to all data, whether originally online or offline, and later digitized in India. Further, does it apply only to India or does it apply beyond? It says it even applies to digital personal data beyond India's boundaries, borders, particularly when it encompasses the provision of goods or services to individuals within the Indian territory. So this has to be all seen in the context of this very emerging big data economy that we are beginning to see all across. And the Digital Personal Data Protection Act is one component, one cogwheel in the bigger wheel of the data economy paradigm as we go. So data fiduciary, who is a data fiduciary? Well, clause two, I says it's a person who by themselves or in conjunction with any other person determines the purpose and means of processing the personal data of the data principle. So every company becomes a data fiduciary. Every legal entity that's collecting information automatically becomes uh, a data fiduciary. Who's a data principal? A person to whom a personal data relates and includes their lawful guardian in case the personal data relates to a minor or a person with a disability. Section four is very important. It says if you're a data fiduciary, you can only process the personal data of a data principal for a lawful purpose. That means no processing is going to be allowed for an unlawful purpose. And you're not going to be allowed for a purpose that's not uh, either specifically uh, prohibited under the law. And you can, of course, process it for legitimate users after duly obtaining the consent of the data principle. Now, for data principle, a lot of people believe that they should not be given the kind of powers that has now been given under the DPDP Act. But I think when I look at the law, the way uh, the judgment in Justice Puttaswamy versus Union of India has been given, every person in India has got the fundamental right to, to privacy as part of the fundamental right to life. Therefore, the consent uh, has to be obtained in a very material, very concrete, crystal clear manner uh, from the concerned person per se. Now, before you give your consent, the law says, please be very satisfied. Who's collecting your data? What is the purpose of what they're collecting the data? Are you happy with the purpose? Do you think the purpose is sufficient for the transaction for which you are interacting with the data uh, fiduciary? And uh, would you be comfortable if they further process it or give the processing to someone else? You take all of these things in mind before you land up giving your consent person. But please ensure that the consent that you obtain has to be free, specific, informed, unconditional, and unambiguous. These are five uh, sisters that have been uh, used under section uh, six. So all of these conditions will have to be fulfilled. If at any point, one point of time, the data uh, principal says, sir, sorry, my consent was not free, then the onus is going to go back on the data fiduciary to prove that the consent of the data principal was indeed free. Also, you as a data principal have been given the right to withdraw your consent at any point of time and inform the data fiduciary, sir, I have withdrawn my consent. And therefore, please stop processing my information. So therefore it will be incumbent on the data fiduciary to stop using and processing the personal data of the data principal within a reasonable time frame, except in situation when the law authorizes the use of such personal data even after the consent is revoked. Now data fiduciary then becomes a central focal point in this new data protection ecosystem. All the spotlight is now going to be on data fiduciary. So therefore, various uh, rights, duties, and obligations of data fiduciaries have been given, which are encapsulated in uh, Section 8 and Section 10 of the DPDP Act. They will have to comply with the applicable law and rules and regulations made thereunder. They'll have to ensure completeness, accuracy, consistency of the personal data of the data principal. They will have to implement appropriate measures uh, to ensure effective observance of the provisions of the DPDP Act. They will have to protect the personal data of the data principal. They'll have to take reasonable measures 
to prevent breach of the personal data, of the data principle. And in case of any such uh, personal data breach, they will must inform the same to the Data Protection Board of India. Of course, they'll have to erase the data in case of the data principle says, sir, please erase my data. They'll have to establish an effective grievance addressing mechanism. They will have to publish their business contact information, uh, specifically of the data protection officer on the online space. They will have to appoint data protection officers. They'll have to have an independent data auditor and they'll have to undertake periodic data protection, impact assessments, and also periodic audits. Further, it's not only the data fiduciary that's been straddled with certain duties, data principle has also been straddled with certain duties which are in section 15. In fact, data principle will have to comply with all applicable laws. They'll have to ensure that they do not impersonate any other person while divulging their personal information. They will be under a duty not to hide any material information and not to file any false or frivolous complaint to the Data Protection Board. And they'll have to give authentic information while sharing their personal data. Now, you as a data principal will have a right to access your personal data at various points of time. It's not that once you've given your data, that's the end of the story, sorry. You can ask the right to access your data. You can ask the right to go ahead and review your data. You can ask and exercise the right to go ahead and uh, correct your data. And therefore, you as a data principal are the person in command. You can ask uh, uh, the data fiduciary, please complete my data. Please update my data. And of course, if you have any grievance, you can actually use the grievance redressal mechanism that's given under the law. The data principal will have the right to nominate. Now, this is a very new concept, right? To nominate any person who will be, become entitled to your personal data after you're dead and gone. You know, the first time you're now finding the right of nomination. I, even under the IT Act, when I look at section one, the Information Technology Act 2000 is not applicable to wills and testamentary instruments. But under the now DPDP Act, you will now have the right to nominate your data uh, to be given to someone else. Of course, the Data Protection Board is now the new statutory authority that's been created. It's been given the powers of the civil court under the CPC, in respect of summoning persons, enforcing attendance, examining them on oaths, and receiving evidence, and also inspecting any data, document, books, etc. Now, in case if there's a data, personal data breach, the Data Protection Board of India will have to be mandatorily informed. They will investigate and then they will direct appropriate remedial and mitigating measures that will have to be followed by the data fiduciary. And they can also uh, impose appropriate penalty as is prescribed under the DPDP Act. This is where the most contentious element of the DPDP Act comes in. How much penalty? Well, nothing much, just 250 crore rupees. That's the maximum penalty that can be imposed upon a data fiduciary per contravention. So supposing you are doing four contraventions, technically the maximum amount of fine that can be imposed against you is will be 1000 crore. Now that's a huge, humongous amount. This kind of amounts have not been seen under the Indian law at any earlier point of time. But then this is what's really got the industry waking up, thinking alive and uh, getting worried about. So if you think your non-personal data will be protected under this law, think again. This law is not protecting your non-personal data. Further, this law has amended the Information Technology Act 2000 and has deleted the provision under Section 43A of the IT Act, which specifically allows you to seek unlimited damages by way of compensation uh, in case your data is unauthorizedly used, accessed, or the value of the same is diminished in any manner whatsoever. Now, the problem is uh, the IT Act is a mother legislation. It is a special law under Section 81 of the IT Act. And the provisions of the same prevail over anything inconsistent to their will, contained in any other law for the timing in force. But the Digital Personal Data Protection Act is not a special law. It's a law in addition to the IT. Though it does say for everything on data, 
what I say will prevail over others. So there's going to be a huge kind of a conflict, both under the IT Act and with the DPDP Act. And there will be a need for more harmonious construction of uh, the two distinctive legislations as we go forward. Now, for the first time, you are now seeing statutory rights, duties, and obligations for data principles, for data for fiduciaries, and data processors. Please be mindful of the fact that when you are a data fiduciary under the DPDP Act, you're also simultaneously a network service provider and an intermediary under Section 21W of the Information Technology Act 2000. So you will have to not just comply with the DPDP Act, but you will also have to comply with the IT Act. Further, uh, in case if there's uh, any kind of uh, conflict or confusion, then the onus will have to be that of the data fiduciary who will have to prove that the processing of the personal data has been done as per the provisions of this law. Now, individuals can obviously as the data principles request deletion, correction, or updation of their personal data. And the question is, a lot of people are disappointed. Why there are no data offenses which have been defined under the DPDP Act? It's only fines up to 250 crores. Yes, that's enough to wipe out any uh, small sector undertaking. But then the criminal aspects or the penal aspects of the law are completely missing. So there are going to be basically two kinds of bubbles. The government has been given the power to exempt government and a number of its agencies from the applicability of this law, which effectively means that there will be two bubbles in the ecosystem of data economy. Number one will be the bubble of the corporates and the covered entities who will all have to comply with the parameters of the DPDP Act. And on the other side will be the second bubble, which will consist of government and government agencies, which are exempted from the applicability of the data, uh, this entire uh, uh, compliance with the DPDP Act. And I see an intrinsic tension, conflict coming in both the set but bum, uh, bubbles in the data economy. Of course, when I look at the powers given to the government for exemption, they are phenomenal. They are very vast, can be exercised under very, very broad terms, including sovereignty and integrity of India, security of India, uh, friendly relations with foreign states, public order, or for preventing incitement to the commission of any cognizable offense. You are going to be finding that the Data Protection Board of India will be levying fines up to 250 crore rupees. You're not satisfied with the fines, no problem. The law says go, go and file an appeal to the appellate board, which will be the TDSAT, the Telecom Dispute Settlement Appellate Tribunal. Of course, this law is also saying, please go ahead and utilize alternate dispute resolution mechanisms, whether it's mediation, conciliation, or arbitration, in, the, in this entire process, once it comes to be known that uh, you have violated this law, so that at least uh, the kind of impact upon you could be minimized. But now with so much of ransomware coming in and uh, huge penalties of 250 crore rupees, it's very hard to currently predict how this entire law is going to effectively map up and will ultimately be implemented. For the See, the entire issues pertaining to data privacy have not been specifically covered. You are only covering small areas pertaining to protection of personal data. So even the principles of law that have been established in the judgment of Justice Putta Swami versus Union of India have not been fully adhered to and have not been fully incorporated under the present law. And uh, because of this unique factor, that as of now, India has got two laws, the Information Technology Act 2000 and the DPDP Act 2023. And both these laws are giving two different definitions of data, which means that there is going to be conflict. Further, RBI has been batting so much hard for Indian users. And thanks to the efforts of RBI, banking data of Indians has been in India. Now, as a result of no impact, or no reference to data localization, which effectively means that maybe RBI would be required to go by uh, and give a 
you know, just a Tata by way to the Siddharth approach. Of course, the government has been given the power. The government can even exempt the RBI from the applicability of this law per se. But the moment you've actually snatched away people's right to seek unlimited damages by way of compensation under Section 43 of the IT Act, the moot question that comes up for consideration is, what is my remedy once my data gets, personal data gets breached? Well, under the DPDP Act, all I can do is make a complaint to the Data Protection Board of India. They will investigate. They can give a fine up to 250 crore rupees. But that fine does not come to me as a data principal. The fine goes to the government of India and has to be deposited in the Consolidated Fund of India. So I, I don't any, get anything. My rights for seeking unlimited damages by way of compensation under Section 43A of the IT Act has already been now revealed by this new law. Also, no new uh, data crimes have been defined under the DPDP Act. So effectively, no remedies have been given to data principals as we've actually gone forward. So that is a gray zone, I think. A lot of work has been uh, left for secondary legislation. But we'll have to wait, wait and see how secondary legislation evolves, primarily because uh, the secondary legislation can never go beyond the scope and applicability of the primary legislation. But uh, when I look at the DPDP Act and uh, the GDPR, I find the DPDP Act is an attempt to basically adopt the principles of the GDPR in the context of uh, the current world. But the question that comes up for consideration is, how does the DPDP Act apply in the context of generative artificial intelligence or artificial intelligence or chat GPT or uh, Google Bard or uh, perplexity? Now, that's one area that things are not clear at all. As well. More so when Indians are right now vomiting a lot of their data on these uh, new platforms. Uh, and with the extensive use of artificial intelligence, we'll have to see how does the actual implementation of the DPDP Act is going to come forward because there were already a lot of challenges as we go forward. Further, because of an absence of a law on cybersecurity, how will the DPDP Act ultimately evolve and implement this uh, question that we'll have to wait and watch. When I look at the entire DPDP Act, there's not a single reference to cybersecurity. But in today's world, I cannot talk about personal data without talking about cybersecurity. And complicating this entire scenario is the fact that India does not have a dedicated law on cybersecurity. So we are bound to see more hiccups, more challenges in this regard as we go forward. I think uh, maybe some parameters of cybersecurity could be stipulated by the government in the form of rules and regulations, but we have to wait and watch. Uh, ideally, it would have been much more better if we would have got more data crimes defined under this new law. Why? Because the data crimes under the existing data protection, uh, under the existing Information Technology Act 2000 are not adequate. And the coverage of data crimes under the IPC is not adequate as a whole per se. So when I compare the Indian DPDP Act with the GDPR, I find that the Indian DPDP Act is a very, very light version of the GDPR. And uh, this 250 crore piece is the only thing that's woken up the entire data stakeholders out of their deep slumber. And uh, this kind of a monies must now be awarded. Why? Because at the end of the day, if you just have these fines up to 250 crore rupees and you're not able to get those fines implemented, then people's confidence in the intrinsic ability and working of the law may themselves be potentially shaken. And also now with the world working on in the direction of Web 3.0, I think this DPDP Act is going to get even more complicated and topical in its applicability to Web 3.0 ecosystem. Therefore, for all stakeholders, due diligence, care, caution, uh, and compliance with law will have to be only mantra to safeguard the stakeholders in this regard. Well, there will be need for massive capacity building, and in this particular context, programs like these become of importance. I've created a platform called cyberlawuniversity.com which is an online education platform. And I, uh, being in, working in cyber law, I thought, let me offer some courses. So I offered about 37 courses online. And I was surprised to find out that these courses have already been done by more than 28,500 students and professionals from 172 countries speaking 52 national languages. 
The figures that are telling us is that there is a need for massive capacity building. Uh, there's a big international conference that uh, my law firm does every year. This is the international conference on cyber law, cyber crime, and cyber security. This year is the 10th edition of the conference taking place from 29th, 30th November to 1st of December 2022. And the focus this year will be on rise of emerging technologies and their impact. And we will specifically be having distinctive sessions on data protection as we go forward. More than 125 organizations globally go ahead and uh, support this particular conference. So all said and done, I think the DPDP Act is a great starting point. But still, we are at a very early stage. We don't exactly know how this particular law is going to go ahead and uh, be shaping up. But having said that, it'll be good to see how it's going to be implemented. With those words, I'm going to hand it back to uh, Pavan for any questions in this regard. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Pavan. You have actually given the correct, uh, I think you have explained everything in detail in the most important and very lucid manner and very effectively you have communicated what is this law, what are the issues in this and what are the different terminology used in this. Now, uh, it's a definitely it's a time of question answer and various people have given uh, various questions also. So before going to the question, specific question, I just want to ask a very important point. Now tell me, I'm feeding the information at, because all the apps, all the websites are there. You are feeding the information. Now you don't know that site is a fraud or that site is good. So for the benefit of everybody, what are the most, because sometimes you are a very lucrative way they are coming out and they are giving you something. Okay. So what do you feel? What are the best way that somebody should not indulge in this, in this um, manipulative aspects and feed the data in the wrong site? Uh, inform, giving your information to these places is seriously, you should not do. But sometimes you are bound to do and sometimes you are, uh, uh, you have seen that Citibank dot something will come and you are, um, uh, um, uh, you are feeding your information, thinking that Citibank is your bank and you are feeding information. SDFC is your bank and they are giving the, the URL where SDFC name is there and you are thinking this is the SDFC. So what is your advice to everybody? Well, my advice uh, in this regard uh, will be very simple. Let's not become a part of the great Indian vomiting revolution that's currently engulfing India. Everybody in India is vomiting data about their personal, professional, social lives without even thinking about the legal ramifications. So let's be very, very clear that we will only now share information on a need to know basis. Number two, we should not really go ahead and be enamored by what other people are saying or what people are talking about. Please, before downloading any mobile application, you'll have to read its terms and conditions, its privacy policy, in order to understand how it's going to deal with your data. And if they are not seeking your consent, then please don't go ahead and use that mobile applications. Now, that I agree is not a consent. Under this new DPDP Act, they will have to give you a specific crystal clear consent uh, format, a template which you'll have to agree on, so if you can uh, be satisfied that this application is uh, going to process your data in a rightful manner, then you can give your consent. Otherwise, it's a great idea to withhold your consent. And also before even downloading or the, this particular app, it's a good idea to go online to find out what are the other people speaking about this particular app? What are the customer reviews? And if people are ventilating their grievances, that also could potentially be an indicator to you of how not to go ahead and share your information. But please don't, uh, don't underestimate your power as a data principal. Now, under this new DPDP Act, assuming you give your consent, and tomorrow you realize, oops, I made a mistake. I should not have given. You can always now insist upon them, write to them saying, I'm withdrawing my consent. Henceforth, please stop processing my personal data. And within a reasonable period of time, they'll have to go ahead and stop your processing of data. 
So it's not that it's irreversible. Till now, what position is happening is, if you have to download an app, you have no choice. You have to uh, click I agree to agree to whatever they have saying, and only then you can utilize this particular app. But now with this particular DPDP act coming in, your hands as a data principal are going to be substantially strengthened. Okay. Yes. Now, Apple and Android, they are they be their online center where you can download any app. Now the question is, suppose what is the checks and balances these people are doing, then the fraud should not come. And if something is going wrong, mm -hmm. is Apple and Android um, uh, owner are responsible? Surely, both uh, Apple and Android owners, the respective companies, ultimately become not just data fiduciaries under the DPDP Act, but they are also intermediaries under Section 21W of the Information Technology Act 2000. Under Section 79-2C of the Information Technology Act, these very companies are required to exercise due diligence while they discharge their obligations under the law. Now, therefore, they are covered by the IT Rules 2021. IT Rules 2021 categorically say under Rule 3 that these service providers and intermediaries will have to adopt reasonable security practices and procedures so as to protect data on their platforms by following the reasonable security practices and procedures which are stipulated under the IT Rules 2011, specifically the information technology reasonable security practices and procedures and sensitive personal data or information rules 2011. That is effectively in ISO 27001. So automatically they have been straddled with various obligations for ensuring the cyber security of data. And should they not do so, then they straight away not just violate the IT Act for which they lose their statutory exemption from legal liability as an intermediary by which your section seven of the IT rules 2021 but more significantly, they become liable to be complained against by the data principal. So a complaint against them can be given to the Data Protection Board of India, and the board will then start an investigation, and the board can then award uh, fines up to 250 crore rupees against them. Of course, the board is going to consider the factors, the, the seriousness of the breach, the kind of negligency or inadequacy or the lack of compliance these will be important factors that will have to be taken into consideration by the board before it determines the quantum of fine. But nonetheless, uh, today, if you are a platform owner like an Apple or an Android Play Store, you cannot say that I will not care. You will now have to care whether you have operations in India or not. The moment your services, your platforms are available on computers, computer systems, computer networks, computer resources and communication devices, located within the territorial boundaries of India, you become automatically amenable both under the Information Technology Act 2000 as also under the DPDP Act 2023. Okay, my, my subsequent question which somebody has asked, like some sites when you are feeding, they are asking your email password. So they are asking email address and then they are saying email password. What is your advice? Is this my email password if I'm giving? then he can download the entire thing of my email and all the information, which is my personal data, it can reach there. So what is the what is the system, how people are asking email password when you are logging to some site or registering to some site? Well, the reason why they've been asking the username, the email and the password is because till today, India didn't have a dedicated law on data protection. Now that the DPDP Act has been uh, passed and has become law, we are still in an interregnum space where the DPDP Act has not been implemented. So because it's not been implemented, it's the law of the land, but because it's not implemented, it's not fully applicable. So therefore, these uh, platforms are continuing to ask about your username or uh, your email or a password. But let's remember, after this DPDP Act comes into implementation, they will no longer be able to ask for it because uh, both my email address and also my password will qualify as personal data, digital personal data. And that being so, prior to asking them, they will have to first give me a notice under section four and five saying, look, hey guys, we want to collect this personal data. Please give me permission and give me the permission for collecting your, your data for this kind of processing only. 
And if only if you give them the permission, will they be in a position to collect your email and password? Otherwise, after this law comes into implementation, I don't see any reason they'll be able to do so. If they do so, then complaint against them can be made and fines up to 250 crore rupees can be imposed against them by the Data Protection Board of India. Are you gone on mute, please? Before coming to a further question answer, I'll look, just look at Ravi Prakash uh, to say a few uh, things relating to his part of understanding. And because he practiced in corporate law and he's facing lots of disputes relating to companies. So Ravi, over to you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, in fact, Doyen in the, in the pioneer of this law, much before this law found its footprints in India, has already spoken at length and the audience and all men in common would have a fair understanding of the law and what cautions they ought to take, regardless of whether there is a law in place or not protecting the data, what cautions they should take. Uh, in uh, I can only add this much that the BN Sri Krishna report, Justice Sri Krishna's report, which is the which which first envisaged the requirement of such a law, as he found that the Information Technology Act and the rules made there under under Section Forty Three A were not sufficient to to tackle the challenge to the privacy of individual due to development of technology and science. He remarked that if India is to shape the global digital landscape in the 21st century, it must formulate a legal framework relating to personal data that can work as a template for the developing world. Also, uh, we know that the global regime on this, I hope I'm audible. Yes, yes, so you are audible. The carry on, carry on. Global regime on the law of data protection is already there. It has been uh, there since 1995 when Europe had its special piece of legislation, which was subsequently supplemented or I must say, replaced by the GDPR. The fact that uh, Europe has this kind of a specialized law, which, which seeks to protect dignity, a facet of which is personal data, either digital or non-digital. You would also be, I mean, it, it would add to the factual context that uh, uh, more than 67 countries outside Europe, out of the total 120 countries, the data is of 120 countries, out of which more than 67 countries have already adopted frameworks like these for, to protect the data of their citizens. In fact, China also has the same kind of legislation, but their legislation is predicated mostly on the national security. Now, speaking of the Indian context, we took into account we have because we were not the first mover, so we had the advantage as, as, uh, as always the second mover or the subsequent mover has to look around and take wisdom from others. We did take into account the system of American jurisprudence on data protection, which is extremely individualistic because their concept of freedom is that freedom from control of state. In Europe, as I said, the concept of dignity, human dignity, personal data is, of course, but only a piece of that broader right to dignity and privacy. And of course, the uh, our Asian counterparts, where national security is also taken as basic. But what is aimed to do through this act is not an extreme view that the digital data should not be processed or it should not be, pro it should be processed only for limited purposes because the 
section 7 which which ordains the legitimate uses is couched in broadest manner possible so therefore what is aimed in india is to evolve in an information or data society where it is recognized in law that processing of data is necessary but at the same time we need a framework a robust framework where the safety of individual rights as well as state interests are appropriately dealt i think uh, that is the only uh, addition or i must say supplement whatever limited i have read about this law i can add here and uh, it is a good step although there are concerns on this law but those concerns i think they only arise when you build a hypothesis on the hyperbole of presumptions it is a good law to start with and uh, the key how this law will fare in the lives of men in common would depend on how informed our citizenry is it is of course your and my data so the responsibility the first line of defense has to be us and for that sufficient knowledge about how technology works how you give up your data while being in cyberspace i think that fundamental knowledge should be there we should be informed and then thereafter we we now have a, a specialized regime and and it is quite deterrent it it should send shock waves to those who unauthorizedly bank upon people's personal data but the first as i said these attempts will never stop because cyberspace is going to be the new space for crimes it already is as we have seen in past decade so therefore the first responsibility is ours and only if the citizenry is informed the benefits the fruits of this law can be taken that is all from my side sir okay thank you ravi thank you pawan bhai and ravi now i have uh, around 25 questions with me so i'm just starting with this so some of the answer you have given but some answer is question is in different way so you can explain uh, when the government mechanism is capable enough to detect source of data leak through ip address etc why can the same be not checked efficiently to protect personal data that's a fantastic question uh, logically if you are able to do that that should also be a great source for uh, protecting data but then the government is not in the business of policing personal data uh, and nowhere across the world do you find this kind of a role though the government has got the sovereign functions as a sovereign power to go ahead and do that most of the time when i look at data protection laws in different part of the world the focus is more on prospective uh, kind of stipulation of rights duties and responsibilities of the relevant stakeholders but if the government was to do this then i can tell you that the government would only be doing this and doing nothing else because this is a humongous kind of quantum of challenge that uh, country is looking at already india is the most populous nation in the world and there is personal data that's of uh, persons digital personal data which is continuing to getting breached every second uh, hour every second minute now a scenario like this the government cannot be expected to leave aside other portions of governance and only concentrate on this therefore uh, though it's technically possible it's not pragmatic situation that's the reason why the focus is more on prescribing the responsibilities of data fiduciaries data processors as also data principles ultimately the data principle has to be sensitized that you are the foundation creation uh, fountain creation of your data so if you're going to be careful and now you will go ahead and share your data then to a large extent your personal data in the digital format could be potentially protected thanks okay are there separate penalties for the entity companies etc and also for the data protection officer in case of data breach well in case of a data breach the maximum penalty is up to 250 crore rupees that penalty will have to go against the company or the legal entity who is responsible for non compliance now 
clearly there could be a number of situations where you the company will say i don't have 250 crore rupees in my balance sheet so in a scenario like this since this money has to ultimately go uh, to the governmental coffers in the form of consolidated fund of india the government will have the right to go ahead and recover this uh, from not just the company its various assets but also the assets of its board members and its cxo level people so i think it's a very very kind of a, a dramatic and very significant legislation so a uh, data protection officer may not be straddled with any particular fine because the fine will have to be against the organization though individually the organizations may take action against the data protection officer that because of your negligence we failed to ensure compliance and because of this we are, we are facing fines therefore you pay us money or you become liable criminally but that's a separate action but as of now under the current uh, regime of the dpdp act there's only fine that's stipulated against the concerned covered entity Thanks. so so uh, mr pawan it means uh, that every company's board when they are taking a compliance certificate from the uh, managing director or company secretary they have to take now this also whether they have protected that they have uh, uh, followed this compliance also absolutely now opens up a new vista a new chapter of exposure to legal liability okay. every board will henceforth be taking a certification from the cxo level people specifically if they have data protection officer along with that the data protection officer that you have ensured compliance and that if you have not ensured compliance we will take appropriate action against you because at the end of the day the board also has to uh, show that it's documented the exercise of due diligence to prevent the commission of any offense uh, and these are the only best mechanisms that they can do the company can always say sir i did everything that was possible in my power and possession i took these certifications i took these statements indemnities and if despite that happened please limit or uh, award lesser quantum of fine upon me because i have done everything that was under my possession and then if you want to make fine against the concerned officer you can go ahead and do that so that could be one kind of a legal stand that will be applicable but yes the moment the dpdp act comes into force every board will now have to start taking specific certifications undertakings uh, uh, from the concerned officers including the data protection officer and all cxo level officers that they have they done complete compliance with the relevant applicable parameters of the dpdp act 2023 okay thanks how will the new act affect companies accumulating their employees and customer data the moment you are a company and you are accumulating your employees data or customer data if it's personal data you become a, a fiduciary a data fiduciary under the dpdp act you will have to ensure compliance you will have to start taking consent afresh from all uh, your existing employees or your new customers from the time the law comes into force for those kinds of customers or employees for which data you already have which you have been using prior to coming into the force of the dpdp act you will still have to take a fresh consent from those people once again that sir i have taken your earlier consent now the dpdp act has come in please give me fresh consent so that i can process your personal data for these number of uh, kind of purposes and then if you take that and then process data then you are safe otherwise uh, you will have to be uh, bearing the legal consequences for non compliance okay now uh, tell me one thing it means the the things which you are saying i am a company and i am knowing this responsibility of penalty and how to manage the data but my employee who is managing this he is taking away and selling the data or giving to somebody so it means in future it is not only that you are collecting information but you have to protect that also number one you have a proper checks and balance to whom you are giving this data and third is that if there is a leakage you are responsible so this is the future which is uh, giving a new dimension to entire ecosystem of the cyber law of data collecting company you are bang on target sir this is the new chapter a new age that started in and you will have to demonstrate doing all of that because if you do that then the chances of the quantum of fine that will be imposed upon your company may be very less because then the data protection board of india will say look you have done everything that was under your power and possession to do that and if despite doing that one of the errant employees have done this illegal activity 
then at least as a company you should not be saddled with the 250 crore rupees mind you it begins from 0 to 250 crore rupees so maybe the quantum of fine could get less therefore the focus will have to be additional compliances and new kinds of uh, uh, data sets and practices that companies will have to follow but you are saying 250 crore is a big amount and what mr uh, uh, amar patnaik has mentioned that it was previously it was global revenue percentage of global revenue that may be 1000 crore so that is a that is a relief for the companies that they, the amount is only 250 crore well, that's a relief of big companies, uh, who are big data yes. companies, but significant data fiduciaries, because yes. for them, 250 crores is nothing. But if yes. I'm a uh, startup company, if I'm an SME, MSME, and I get startled with 250 crore rupees, I'm going to go out of uh, operation. So yes. it has to be seen in a holistic perspective. Okay. But I agree uh, that our approach is slightly lesser. Uh, we have still uh, slightly, shall I say, watered down the GDPR mark, which is 4% of the annual global turnover. Uh, that does a maximum fine which could run into a very, very humongous amount of money. Thanks. When we receive a call from unknown number stating our name and when asking caller where from he or she got our number on receipt of reply that she has got from data of his or her company, that is the what is the remedy available to us? Because they are they're calling you and saying, oh, no, no, sir, we... We have this data in our company or you have applied somewhere sometime, which is they're telling wrong. So what is the remedy? So in a scenario like this, after the DPDP Act comes into force, you have one singular remedy. You can immediately go and file a complaint to the Data Protection Board saying, sir, after the DPDP Act has come in, they have not given me notice. They have not taken my consent, but they are still using my data because for purposes of calling me, they have processed my personal data. And even if I had given them earlier, they have not taken fresh consent, please give a fine up to 250 crore rupees. And then the data protection board is going to uh, go ahead and investigate. But that's the maximum that you can do. In addition, you can always see that, that look, this is a violation of my personal privacy. And uh, need be, you can also uh, go ahead and uh, register a criminal action against the entities under the relevant provisions of the Information Technology Act 2000 and the rules and regulations made thereunder. But by and large, most of the companies will be more bothered or concerned or uh, be uh, connected with this 250 crore rupees. So that is a much, much bigger end of a democles sword that's going to hang on uh, people's head. But please understand, if you think even with 250 crore rupees, our personal data is not going to be misused, think again. There will be entities outside India who will say, I'm not bothered about Indian law. I am not in India. You catch me if you want to, but I will still go ahead and misuse your law. In those kinds of scenario, we'll have to look at more uh, proactive and effective mechanisms on how to protect personal data of persons. Thanks. Any tentative timeline by when we could expect the rules under the new digital DP law? Well, uh, the Minister of State, uh, Mr. Chandrasekhar, has on 20th of September indicated that uh, in 30 days' time, the rules are likely to be out and the Data Protection Board of India is likely to be constituted. So it could come in as early as October 2023. And if it's going to be in place, then the government could start implementing different sections of uh, the act. For example, I think this entire sections pertaining to consent, pertaining to giving of notice is something that's going to come up immediately. But the, the other sections which are requiring you to uh, you know, ensure and take appropriate uh, precautions while you're collecting data of children, Companies are saying, I require to develop my software for the purposes of identifying whether the particular age of the particular data <coughs> subject is uh, below 18 or not. And for that, I require time for which the government has indicated that maybe they even may want to give about up to one year for companies to really comply with the, the child protection provisions. But all this is, again, conjectures and based on what is limitedly available in the public domain. We'll still have to wait and watch what are the final timelines when these said rules are going to be published by the government. As a public company, what precautions should we take in terms of contacts? As a public sector undertaking, or a, I, I need to take various precautions. Uh, I think proactively, start with some basic cyber hygiene. Please start having your notices ready uh, and uh, start uh, getting consents in place. You can identify where your current uh, data big sets are, 
where is the personal data sets located and try to identify what are the various constituents that are covered in the big data sets so that you are in a better position. Now, already we have begun advising so many of our clients on proactively complying with the provisions of the DPDP Act. Look, once the Act has been passed by Parliament, it's a law of the land. Uh, so it's only a question of when it's going to be implemented. But if we proactively start uh, providing uh, notices to all our data principles, start taking consent even before the law comes into force, I am in a much more advanced level of preparation. And that's what I would want uh, public sector companies to specifically focus on because their exposure is more high. They are potentially going to be more fertile targets for being targeted by complaints uh, for fines up to 250 crore rupees. Those could be your initial, shall I say, low-hanging fruits that you would want to do. In addition, I would want this kind of companies to ensure their compliances under the IT Act and rules and regulations so that they are protected from a 360 degree viewpoint in terms of personal data, whether it's of employees, whether it's of customers, or whether it's of business partners that they are retaining or that they will be processing in the course of time. Thanks. Okay, how are the candidates data will be protected? Uh, candidates provide their details to fill up forms in the competitive exam and the same data used by the college, university, coaching institute and other organization to send emails and SMS without consent. Well, henceforth, after the DPDP Act comes into uh, implementation, all candidates' data will be, which is of course uh, digital personal data, will be protected in the sense that the company or the platform or the organization that you're applying will be a data fiduciary and will be only able to collect that. So now you now begin to start seeing a new phenomenon where before you are able to even submit your forms as a candidate, they will first give you a notice and take your consent. And only then they will be able to accept your forms. But if that forms are accepted, then clearly the onus will be upon the data fiduciary to ensure that your data is not leaked to these coaching centers or these call centers for you to be flooded with SMSs and other calls. Because if they do so, you can always complain against the said entities for appropriate fines. So I think this kind of practices are going to substantially get diminished with the passage of time once the DPDP Act gets fully enforced. Okay. What is the appointed date of the said Act? I think this you have given answer uh, because when they will uh, uh, notify, whether, whether rules are framed or they have to yet to frame it. The government is in the process of framing rules, but they are saying that in the next 30 days, they will be coming up with rules published in the public domain. Okay. Are data principle also penalized for not adhering to their duties? Is it fair, uh, is it fair to do that? No, when I look at that, uh, the fine is never going to go against the data principle. Uh, okay. Because one of the provisions of this law is that assuming that the data principle did not fulfill his duties, nonetheless, the responsibility or the exposure towards liability of data fiduciary cannot be relegated to a secondary level. So ideally, if you're a data principal, the law is saying, please be more careful. Please don't share information. But assuming you did that, and as a result of which your data came to the hands of the data fiduciary, the onus will still be on data fiduciary because the fine will ultimately be imposed on data fiduciaries and data processors. So I don't see any, um, shall I say, penalization of the data principle, though when I look at the holistic legislative architecture of this new legislation, I can tell you that the data principle does not have any effective remedies under this new law because he doesn't get to get a penny of the 250 crore rupees fine, which is going to go to the government of India. He does not get access to any criminal remedies because no data crimes are defined under the IT, uh, under the DPDP Act. And even if he goes in uh, for offenses, under the IT Act and IPC, because the provisions of the DPDP Act vis-a-vis -vis personal data will prevail over other provisions, he's not likely to get an effective remedy. So he has been left high and dry. Uh, okay. So in a scenario like this, he cannot be penalized. Though I think over a period of time, I do expect some effective remedies to be given to data principles by rules and regulations. What are the steps that corporates should take right now on the organizational level to prepare for this act? Please jump into the preparation pool right away. Uh, since this is already the law of the land, please start your compliances vis-a-vis -vis your notices, vis-a-vis -vis your uh, uh, getting of consents. And for all your existing customers for which you have already been collected and doing 
with personal data as a test case, start taking their consent again. For the piece, look at the various odd parameters. There are more than about four dozen parameters that have been stipulated under the DPDP Act. Please start complying with almost all of them. Don't wait for the last minute. In India, we have a problem. We think that, you know, we love cricket, so we can all put, hit six sixes over the last six balls of a T20 match. That may never happen. So in the context, when your exposure is going to be up to 250 crore rupees, the quicker you proactively start complying with documentation, with processes, procedures and policies, the better it's going to be. And if that also means making appropriate changes to your softwares, to your existing processes and computer systems, please start doing it at the earliest so that by the time the government implements the various provisions of this act, you are already in an advanced level of preparedness and implementation of the provisions of the DPDP Act. Pawan Bhai, I think uh, this is the right time that uh, we should organize one webinar specifically for the corporate world that what preparation they should do because either you are collecting data of em employee data everybody is collecting then you are collecting data of the customer or you are giving your data to somebody so and your employees are also working they are also coming to this trap so I think we should do it because somebody is asking this question, is data judiciary supposed to collect the consent of data principle for all the collected data before the implementation of this act? So these types of queries people have in their mind. So we should organize one program specifically how to prepare to, to face this particular new, new law. I completely endorse. It's a great idea. That's going to help uh, demystify a lot of these mysteries around the DPDP Act. So, so we will we will do this uh, shortly before the uh, implementation of this law. It is very, very important. Is there a provision not sh uh, uh, should be whether the site URL is compliant with the act provision like some indicator symbol on the face of it or whether there is a prom pro promote uh, prompted like Play Store? Well, uh, when I look at this particular question, is there a provisioning? Um, sorry, I'm, uh, is there a provisioning should not whether the site URL is compliant with the act provision? The act does not talk about the URL being compliant. The act talks about the covered entities to be compliant. Who are the covered okay. entities? Individuals, companies, organizations, uh, um, limited liability partnerships, government, uh, uh, trust, or a society. So your site URL is not going to be showing whether you are compliant or not. But ultimately, if somebody complains against you, your data practices are going to be investigated. And on that basis, if you are found to be non-compliant, then as a company, appropriate fines are going to be imposed on you. Okay. Can some entity be data fiduciary for one and consent manager for another? Absolutely. Please understand, it's a constantly changing world. And because we have so many complex relationships and transactions happening, you can at the same time be a data fiduciary in one transaction. You can be a consent manager in another transaction. You can also be a data processor in a third transaction. So okay. each case will be dependent upon the facts and circumstances of each case to determine what is your specific capacity in that transaction. Okay. So uh, will cookies also require consent? Absolutely. Cookies are ultimately nothing but uh, computed or computed automated information. And uh, but cookies are not consent. Uh, for given prior to do, uh, for doing cookies also, you'll have to still give notice to the data principal under the DPUDP Act. You still will have to take specific consent that, sir, I will be now bombarding your system uh, with cookies or I will be sending cookies. Please give me permission to do so. If you give a crystal clear consent to do so, only then they'll be able to send cookies into your system, otherwise not. Okay. Why no distinction is made between personal data and sensitive personal data? Well, that's a million dollar question. This law has not gone in that particular direction. The reason for this primarily is that uh, rule uh, three of the information technology, reasonable security practices and procedures and the sensitive personal data or information rules 2011 have already given a very exhaustive definition of sensitive personal data. So, uh, and this includes not just information pertaining to your financial records, your health records, your biometrics, 
your sexual orientation and things like that. So the moment here, this law is saying, I'm only talking about personal data. Digital personal data automatically is a much, much more broader uh, umbrella under which the sensitive personal data is going to automatically fall into. So they have not sought to specifically clarify by this, but when I would read the DPDP Act, specifically sections four, five, and six, and when I read that in conjunction with section 81 of the IT Act and rule three of the information technology, reasonable security practices and procedures, and sensitive personal data or information rules 2011, I get a cumulative harmonious answer that your sensitive personal details and data are going to get covered under this broad definition of personal data under the DPDP Act 2023. Okay, how DP Act is effective or efficient when it comes to the application of dark on deep web where IP address is impossible to find out? Nothing works on the dark, dark net, on the deep net. The DPDP Act, though it's mentioned for the entire ecosystem, will effectively only be operational and effective on the, uh, the superficial net, or at best, at best, the deep net. On the dark net, when you are, in any case, your identity is uh, camouflaged and is hidden behind 10 different layers by the Onion router, it will be extremely impossible to go ahead and implement the provisions of the DPDP Act in the dark space. Uh, the reason for this is that you don't even know who is who, whether it's a legal entity, whether it's a data principal, whether it's somebody else. So in a scenario like that, uh, first and foremost, it's a dark, deep underbelly of the internet. Number two, uh, it's a place where internet has made geography history. Number three, it's a place where cybercrime as an economy is the only model out there. And number four, where law enforcement agencies still today have not been able to put their homework in place on how to go ahead and detect and uh, convict cyber criminals on the dark net, I think it's going to be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to implement the DPDP Act in the context of the dark net. Okay, now there is a question of so the, the, uh, the fraud versus uh, the DPDP Act. So suppose I have signed some signature and somebody has scanned and digitized without my knowledge, will it fall in IPC or will it fall in the DPDP Act also? Well, when I've done the, such an exercise and I've scanned fraudulently your signatures, then obviously I have engaged in electronic forgery. That being so, if I've done it for cheating purposes, it becomes an offense under Section 468 of the Indian Penal Code, punishable with seven years imprisonment and fine. Further, if you would have scanned my signatures for the purposes of harming my reputation, you would still also be committing an offense under Section 469 of the Indian Penal Code, punishable with three years imprisonment and fine. So clearly those provisions will be applicable because there are no criminal provisions under the DPDP Act. This does not mean that the IPC cannot be invoked. The relevant provisions under the IPC and the IT Act will continue to be invoked for the criminal aspects. It is only for the pecuniary fine up to 250 crore rupees that stipulated the provisions have been made under the DPDP Act 2023. Okay, while opening a company's bank account, we are submitting KYC of company, KMPs, authorized person. Is this case of companies submitting their authorized person's data, does the company become data fiduciary? Absolutely, because the company, when it is submitting the personal information of its authorized representative, it's determining the manner in which how the personal data of the company representative is going to be processed. And therefore, it immediately becomes in the capacity as a data fiduciary. Uh, and therefore, it will have to ensure the compliance with the relevant parameters of the DPDP Act. Okay, Pawan Bhai, we have, we, still we are uh, pouring with the questions, so uh, let's have a uh, rapid round. So you just uh, give a, uh, so we can cover. Data protection yes. officer should be in India or from outside the India. What law says? The law is currently silent, but uh, over time it's expected that the data protection officer should be in India. It's in line with what the principles of jurisprudence has evolved under the grievance officer under the IT rules 2021. Okay, definition of data includes processing by automated means. Would this not cover AI process personal data? Ideally, yes. But how do you go ahead and implement uh, the DPDP Act in the context of processing of personal data by uh, generative artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence? That's a very, very gray zone. The law has not gone in that particular direction. But I think we are bound to see more challenges in this regard. Are our data while using Google really protected? If yes, how Google may be ensuring that not to avoid a stated penalty because what is happening when we are asking Google anything and you have seen today, 
you just talk with somebody about some travel said so you have want to go to goa you want to go to bombay and suddenly the hotel list travel list that will pop up is it not a violation of privacy it's a gross violation of privacy unfortunately india does not have a dedicated law on privacy and because a fundamental right to privacy is only applicable against the state the maximum that you can do is only seek damages uh, but clearly uh, google in a scenario like this clearly would become a data fiduciary and will have to ensure compliance with the dpdp act 2023 what hr division should do the compliances in respect of dpdp because there are so many employees in companies 5000 2000 1000 for hr departments my only message is please tighten your belts you have a lot of now new work to do for all your existing employees please start getting fresh consent and for all the new employees in any case you'll have to get fresh consent so fresh notices to existing and new employees fresh consents have to be a study points okay normally consent is obtained per force while applying for loan exams etc or the registering for a app or portal this shows helplessness even after dpdp act or not well typically pre dpdp you are absolutely correct but post dpdp you will have to ensure that the consent will have to be obtained in a crystal clear unambiguous manner without any outside force coercion or influence so therefore now the data fiduciaries will have to give appropriate mechanisms where you can actually deny your consent but how this effectively will work will be dependent on what kind of rules and regulations the government is going to come up in this regard okay every company should require a privacy policy absolutely 100% you have to have a privacy policy thanks to the mandate of rule 3 of the it rules 2021 so you prepare privacy policy we will discuss in the next program about this that how to do it and this will the data principle be informed about any action or non action by the board taken against the data privacy breach currently it does not talk of the data principle to be informed it only talks about the power of uh, the the board to investigate but as i see new 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 rules and regulations coming in on the the data protection board i think it will be logically a part part of the principles of natural justice that the data principal must be informed as to what is the status and outcome of his complaint against the errant data fiduciary okay will dpdp act enable a route for professional ethical hackers dpdp act is going to open up a pandora's box of not just challenges but also new opportunities so for ethical hackers it's going to be a gold mine because now companies will say please come in take my permission identify what my, my areas are where i am ultimately vulnerable so that I, i can go ahead and limit my exposure to legal liability okay uh the act does not grant data principal the right to data portability and the right to be forgotten is it right that's absolutely correct the law has not gone in that particular direction the law has only got in gone in the, the limited direction of right to erasure but the right to be forgotten in the complete manner as how it's been defined under the gdpr has not yet been gone into same other similar issues of portability i think hopefully under the rules the government may clarify on issues in this regard okay last two questions significant data fiduciary how are they different from data fiduciary there is no definition of significant data fiduciary there is no definition and it's been left to the subjective discretion the government may at appropriate time by notification specify certain data fiduciaries to be significant data fiduciaries so let me give an example keeping in mind like the significant uh, social media intermediaries under the it act are those intermediaries who have minimum up to 50 lakh users and above so i think some kind of a user uh, database or a limit is going to be stipulated that if you have contacts or if you have personal data up to say x amount of x lakhs of um, users then uh, beyond that you will be considered as a significant uh, data fiduciary this question is big but very important great to see that dpdp act is in place i have spent lot of my career in europe singapore where implementation is effective but considering our challenges in india do you think individual may or may not be aware of their rights like the ones to provide consent for their data to be collected and processed by data fiduciary and the details of what such consent entail which could limit the law's effectiveness moreover business may not fully understand their obligation also complying uh, complying could have big cost for msme 
business need to invest in system processes also additionally the law effectiveness will also depend on the capacity of the data protection authority to enforce its provision you have the same thing that all the companies those who have to follow they have to really follow and they have to prepare the systems also which is costly and the people are not um, uh, very effective and the system is also not effective so what is your view well my view is i truly endorse your thought process most of the users are completely ignorant of their rights under the dpdp act and therefore there's incumbent upon the government and the respective stakeholders that you should have public broadcasting messages informing people of their rights under the dpdp act because if they are not going to be informed then they will continue to blindly keep on giving their consent without even thinking about the ramifications and tomorrow they could become guinea pigs in the hands of potential data fiduciaries need for more capacity building is there and i think uh, it has to be done both within the organization and beyond but don't expect magical results it's a dramatic legislation it's going to take a couple of years to get finally finally and fully implemented but yes every stakeholder has to go ahead and uh, give its own contribution in enhancing capacity building and awareness about the various provisions of this new dpdp act 23 thank you very much pawan bhai you have i think you have six on each ball okay you hit the six on each wall the the way you have a control uh, on the subject the way you have given answer and the way you have mentioned each and every point related to this has to you and really it's a marvelous thing and uh, i think this particular law requires more awareness because this is one thing which is affecting everybody which i have told you just now and this the ignorance of this law will create havoc in the corporate world by not implementing especially the the small sector msme which people are following and they are not thinking of security system cyber law and other thing so thank you very much thank you amar bhai thank you pavan thank you ravi for uh, giving a very important and the way public is there is still there half the public is still waiting 100 people are there it shows that they are really interested in this and they have given us the right question right thing so friends thank you very much you have participated you have asked questions and we have given reply in case some questions are not uh, not answered or you have a sp- still some few question you write to us we will help with the help of pavan uh, we will uh, give you a reply and shortly we are coming out one webinar how to prepare to face this new law in your company and how you prepare for yourself with this we'll organize program and next friday 4 to 6 we'll meet again with some new topic new things thank you very much